This is Truly Independent, a show that demystifies the indie film journey by documenting the process of releasing independent films in theaters. Each week, Garrett Batty and I, Darren Smith, will update you on our journey, bringing guests to share their insights into the process and answer your questions. Today on the show, it's the episode you've all been waiting for. We are going deep into the numbers. How do movies make money? You'll wanna watch this one on YouTube because we are gonna draw it out for you today on Truly Independent. Dude, Garrett, how the heck are you, man? Hey, good, how are you? Oh, so good, because today, even though it's August 20th, uh, tonight, as this episode comes out, is our premiere, and this is release week. Like, our movie comes out this Friday. <laughs> it's so cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's feeling feeling good. That is so exciting, and uh, man, it's gone so fast, and it is kind of strange, because we are recording two and a half, three weeks early. I guess three weeks early, but... Uh, but yeah, I, I got to get in that mindset. Yeah, it's it is weird. I've been trying to like transport myself all morning, but I I do that anyway. Like I've I subscribe to the uh, think and grow rich uh, principles of like set a goal and you know use it every morning, every night, and reiterate it and memorize it. Say it back to yourself like these uh, not mantras, but just these uh, what's the word for those things sayings. There's a better word for that. It'll come to me. Um, But yeah, it's been really fun going through this. We still have a lot of work to do over the next three weeks, but um, I'm really excited because people can now go see our movie this week. They can buy tickets. They can go see it. Like, holy cow, it's here. (laughs) Yeah, this is the Utah opening weekend. So our plan right now is to be on, you know, 25, 30, maybe 35 screens as we open on Thursday night, you guys can go see the faith of angels movie. And, uh, and I think next week we'll be talking about, um, box office receipts and how it went. Yeah. We get to transition from talking about other people's box office to transition (laughs) talking about our box office, which I'm very excited for. And it kind of sets us up for the conversation we're going to have today. Uh, we have, we should look at box office, but Uh, And then we'll get into the topic for today. So how about we do that? Let's swap over to Box Office Mojo, looking at the weekend, August 16th through 18th, 2024. What do we got? Uh, Alien Romulus came out over the weekend. $42 million gross. They played on 3,885 screens. So great. I mean, that's a $10,000 per screen average. Uh, Yeah. And I was reading this morning, they did a a hundred, they did a, I think a hundred million worldwide opening weekend, which is yeah. also awesome for them. Yeah. Disney's just killing it this year. Um, I saw something else this week where Disney now has the highest um, box office for every single rating for G, PG, PG 13 and R. <laughs> they have now the highest grossing movies in each one of those categories, which is just domination pure domination is what that is <laughs> yeah well they they know how to distribute they know how to distribute thank goodness and they've proved yeah. that over and over yeah the, this number two was still deadpool and wolverine also yeah. disney which it feels still did 30 million so in its fourth weekend that, but we've got deadpool and alien released by walt disney studios so yeah so i'm not sure how i feel about that uh but good, good for them <laughs> uh, scroll down to uh, number nine. Here we go. Number nine, a movie called Stree 2. Looks like a, uh, then uh, let's see, after the events of Stree. Okay, so it's a sequel. The town of Shandari is being hunted again, haunted again. Okay. Uh, this was released. It's a comedy horror released on over 600 screens, and it is the number nine movie with a box office. A uh, total of $2.5 million on its opening weekend, 600 screens. The plan works. The goal works. Hopefully, November 1st, you'll see Carpenter 1 on there, right at breaking into that top 10, 600 plus screens, right around that $1.5 million weekend. We'll see. Yeah. Are you just setting yourself up for a possible Carpenter 2? Is that what you just did? <laughs> <laughs> Say, so, uh, oh, hey, man, the story is there. The story is there. Lots of stuff uh, going on. Lots of action. I mean, The Carpenter is a fun movie. We haven't talked about it for a little bit, but it is a 
I mean, essentially, it's this fight movie and this action movie uh, set in Nazareth, and it's unlike anything people have seen. It has a heavy metal soundtrack, uh, and it, it, when people watch it, they, they take the first five to ten minutes to be like, "Wait, what is going on here?" And then they're immediately like taken and go, "Okay, I'm in, I'm in," and then they go for the fun ride. And so, yes, I could do. We, we could do a, another series of Carpenter movies. That is true, man. Exciting. Uh, I'd go back to to uh, Cape Town in a heartbeat. I'm sure I've said that a dozen times on this podcast now at this point. But what's exciting, and I wanted to point out with Street Two, like that's one of the highest indie openings we've seen since we've been covering this. Usually, it's kind of the four hundred thousand to one point five million. This did two and a half million in its opening weekend. Yes, it's a sequel, but they still use the same model, 600 screens, just over 600 screens. And like, they killed it. So I, I haven't seen any of the marketing for that movie. I haven't seen a trailer. I haven't heard about that movie, but obviously they did a good job tapping into the audience that liked the first one and got them to show up because they sold, what is that? 250,000 tickets in a weekend, which is amazing. So that's good job, yeah, guys. That, that's amazing. That is having an audience and knowing what they want. Uh, is what we knew. It's fine if uh, come November second, when we're, you know, if we're landing somewhere on this chart in that top ten area, people say, you know, we might get plenty of people to say, "What? I've never heard of the Carpenter. What is that?" And that's absolutely fine. And we're going for the audience that uh, that we're building with that brand, and and um, that's who we need to support the movie. Uh, I will note that uh, scroll down a few more. Number twelve is my Penguin friend. Um, on a thousand, one thousand screens, yeah. uh, distributed by roadside attractions, and they usually they do oftentimes do a similar model of that six hundred to a thousand screens, and uh, just came in at number twelve with another with a one point oh two million at the box office, and so uh, kudos to them again. Just like I, I love this model, and I think we can make it work. Yeah, it's exciting to be testing it out and be learning from this one. I think Faith of Angels is going to do really well. We've already seen a really good swell since we've been talking about premiere and tickets and stuff happening this week and next week. Um, it's really exciting to see it the groundswell start, right? It um, is. And Darren, I know we're recording this. Uh, you know, we, we're listening to this September 9th, but we're recording it in August. We just just put our premiere tickets on sale. Kind yeah, of announced an hour, that and a half via, <laughs> an hour and a half ago, announced it via our email list that was built by people sharing the trailer and people uh, logging on to request, um, you know, a theater near them. And so we have this list of, of, of active audience, potential audience, and we're seeing a, a little bit of a hubbub with the, uh, you know, good action, good, good activity with our premiere tickets being on sale. So... Uh, I'm, I'm excited. It's very encouraging. Yeah. It's also fun to be able to re-engage with a lot of the cast and crew that we worked with a year ago, whereas the last year has kind of been pretty quiet. Like you make a movie and then everybody kind of goes away and they all go make other movies and we finish the movie and get it ready for release. But like now that we get to talk with Cody and Charlotte and all of the crew that's been like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it's finally coming out. I can't wait to be there. Like, it's so fun to have another opportunity to see all them, to chat with them. And I'm excited for this premiere. So good times ahead. Yep. Yep. Should be fun. Yeah. Um, okay. What are we going to talk about today? We don't have a guest because we wanted to kind of dive into some of the behind the scenes, the analytics and numbers and quants and everything associated with what's been driving our decisions um, on this. Yeah, you just said so many of my favorite words. <laughs> hey, indie filmmakers and movie lovers. This show is sponsored by Purdy Distribution. Since 2011, they've been bringing incredible independent films to theaters like Garrett Batty's The Saratov Approach, T.C. Christensen's Love Kennedy, and McLean Nelson's Once I Was a Beehive. They've worked with top-notch directors like Mitch Davis and Mark Goodman, specializing in family, faith-based, and funny films. This year alone, they've released hits with JK Studios like Go West and Villains Inc. 
and have even branched out internationally with films shot in South Africa and Japan. Purdy Distribution works closely with indie filmmakers, designing personalized distribution plans, whether it's a theatrical release or straight to streaming on platforms like Amazon, iTunes, Google, and more. If you have a PG or PG-13 film ready for the world, think about reaching out to Purdy Distribution. They're approachable and knowledgeable, ready to help you visualize your film's distribution. Even if your film isn't fully polished, they can offer valuable guidance. Plus, if you need that crucial distribution piece for investor packages, Purdy Distribution can provide a letter of intent to distribute, helping you secure funding without locking you into a contract. Mark your calendars for Purdy Distribution's upcoming releases, Tokyo Cowboy on August 30th, the digital release of Thabo and the Rhino Case on September 1st, Faith of Angels in theaters on September 12th, Villains Inc. on Amazon and iTunes on October 1st, and The Carpenter on November 1st. To stay updated on these releases and more, sign up for their newsletter at purdydistribution.com. That's P-U-R-D-I-E distribution.com. Now, back to the show. Yeah, we're going to dive into the numbers today, and I'm so excited. So if you're listening to this, I would encourage you to pause it and go over to YouTube and watch it, because what I'm going to do right now, Garrett, is I'm going to share my screen, and I've okay, got my I'll iPad pulled up. And so what's going to happen now is you and I can see my screen and we're going to talk through two different aspects of the numbers that really have been driving this strategy that we're talking about. So one of them is how do you make money? Like this is a question every investor is always asked uh, when we have these conversations like, okay, well, how does your movie make money? So we're going to walk through kind of, we call it the waterfall of once a ticket is sold and you are, your movie is in theaters, how does that trickle down to money in your and my and the film's bank account, right? So we're going to talk about that, but we also want to talk about, and I think we want to talk about this one first, is, you know, a few weeks ago, we had a, a almost two hour conversation, you and I, where we were diving really deep into some data. And so why don't we start there? The, the data that we were looking at was really around, there's a term called comps, which stands for comparable movies. So if we look at other movies in the same genre and the same budget range, and really that followed kind of a similar strategy, a thousand or, or less screens, or maybe 2000 or less screens. So we're not talking wide release studio movies. Um, where did they perform really well? What theaters, what chains, what locations, what regions? And let's kind of hand pick the the theaters we want to release this movie in. So why don't we dive into some of those numbers? I don't know if you've got that spreadsheet pulled up, but I certainly do. Can't share the data because it's a little proprietary, but we can definitely talk about what we learned and what we took away from that. So where do you want to start with this, Garrett? So yeah, so anytime we're budgeting a movie, it, it, I mean, it even starts long before, hey, where are we going to put it in theaters? Comp titles come when you're pitching a movie. Right. And you're saying, hey, I, I want to do a faith based movie set in 1989 about a true story. And so you'll start to put together comp titles and say, has that been done before? Is there an audience for these types of films? You know, and you start to say, OK, well, let's look at, you know, everything from his only son, uh, his only son is a f low budget independent film released by Angel Studios, faith based story uh, about Abraham. Uh, then we look at uh, um, Ordinary Angels which is uh, from the, the Irwin brothers and kingdom story. And uh, just really kind of the, the high bar of independent film, uh, um, but faith-based film and, and a, a similar title. We have one called escape from Germany, which is uh, we've, we, we've had TC on the podcast. Now that wasn't out when we initially started raising money for this movie or building a budget. But we start to say, okay, these are our comp titles, and then chosen. Obviously, we need to work that in as a faith-based, uh, faith-based title with which people are very familiar. But that's, you know, if we want that success, let's put that not necessarily in our comp title for pitching the movie, but an idea of what what we can do if uh, if a movie like this takes off. So we have a number of different. And unsung heroes is another comp that we used for Faith of Angels. Um, and we start to realize that these movies, you know, if we make a movie for a certain budget and put it in similar screens uh, that those films played in, 
that there is an audience for that. There's an opportunity to recoup based on what those similar movies have been done. Yeah. So as we start looking at the data, I'm going to kind of talk about what we're seeing, even though we can't show it. And um, you can always stop me if I say something I'm not supposed to say about the numbers here. But we we took data from across all of those projects, His Only Son, Ordinary Angels, Unsung Hero, Escape from Germany, and then two different releases of The Chosen where they put, you know, two or three episodes into theaters. Um, and we basically sorted them on the average um, box office for each one of those releases. So some of the theaters didn't release any of those um, or, or four out of the five or whatever it may be. And we've got 2,848 theaters that we have data for ranging from $24 in box office <laughs> all the way up to scroll, 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 lots of data, $56,000. Yeah, for one theater, like one theater, the average was $56,000. So like on that one, we can see that some movies did over 100,000 in that theater and others did closer to 30,000. So the average was 56 for that theater across those titles. And then what we did was we sorted the average gross and we said, okay, if these theaters have historically performed really well for the comp, the comparable movies, um, for Faith of Angels, we want to know which theaters those are so we can target them and make sure that we're booking our movie in theaters that have a high average as opposed to a low average, right? Did I say that correct? Yeah, you did. And the reason that that is important to us is because, you know, these movies, you've got Ordinary Angels and uh, Chosen and they they are, they are, they have uh, comparatively much bigger marketing budgets and much bigger audiences that are already aware um, of, of uh, the, the filmmakers or the stars or the stories. And so they are going to be playing in these thousand, you know, 2000 plus screens. Yeah. Um, our movie, we have, you know, we're opening in Utah on 25 to 35 screens. And then uh, in two weeks, we'll open across the country on 200 to 400 screens there's a cost associated with getting a movie to those screens. And so we want to make sure that we're not spending that cost, sending our movie to a screen that doesn't perform. Yeah. And there's not just the physical cost of like shipping a poster and a DCP, but as we've said before, if you put a movie in a theater and you don't tell anybody about it, that's a great strategy to make $24 because you sold two tickets over a weekend. And then that theater is not going to book you the next weekend. And so really we want to look at where can we place the movie, but also place some marketing dollars so that we can get people to show up to those theaters. Right. Correct. Okay. Correct. And so, then also, you know, uh, uh, even, even deeper into that and you say, okay, if we're going to open faith of angels in Atlanta, um, you know, and we're picking five theaters, n not only do we have hopefully some high grossing theaters based on the data, but also location wise. Okay. Is this North of Atlanta? Can the people that want to see it who live South, can they, will they travel up there or do we need to open another screen, you know, 30 miles away to get that audience? And so yeah. all of the research uh, has to go into that. Yeah. It, and this is why you hire a distributor <laughs> because they have this experience. They've done this multiple times and they know, Oh, we're going to do these five theaters here because it, it, the map works and the strategy works and we know the people and we can, negotiate some help with the marketing, you know, all those things come into play. There's a lot of variables, but we just wanted to make sure that we're targeting and looking at the right theaters, right? So once we got all that data and put it into a spreadsheet, we then sorted based on average gross. And what we found was, if I scroll, 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 scroll again, we set a target. Maybe you can speak to this. We set a target of any theater that's north of $5,000 kind of got the green light, the automatic green light, right? And so we found 1,250 theaters that historically for our comps had done at least $5,000 for that theater, for the run of show, for that movie, or across the average of those movies. So we had 1,250 theaters 
that were greater than or equal to five thousand dollars so tell me talk to me about that number garrett because it doesn't cost us five thousand dollars to put it into a theater why that number why not ten why not four like where did that number come from well i think that comes from wanting to uh, looking at our gross we say 1250 theaters at five thousand or more and we um let's see we might need to edit this darren what's the answer you're looking for how you determined five thousand was the 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 cutoff uh i don't know seemed to seem like a good number <laughs> was there a logic behind it oh that's what i was curious about if there's not logic behind it then that's okay <laughs> no there's no logic behind it okay well we'll pick it up from there so essentially we we picked five thousand dollars as a cutoff to say that's a pretty um if we did average at that theater we would get five thousand dollars from that theater. And if we, you know, extrapolate that out over two, three, 400 theaters, it's a pretty decent box office. That's kind of our thinking there. And so we went to the distributor to Purdy and said, all of these theaters have an automatic green light. You can book any of these 1250 theaters. We only have budget for two to 400, but any of any of them that are above this threshold, go ahead and book. And it was like a really cool conversation for them to go, oh, that's cool. Thanks for doing that work. And we felt really confident that, oh, that's a winning strategy. If we know we're only booking theaters that have had a good showing for our comps, maybe that helps us in the box office when we release our movie, right? Yeah. And Darren, you, you asked about the 5,000 threshold, and I, I kind of struggled to come up with a, or an answer there. And I'm realizing the 5,000 was selected because by the time, and we'll go into this for the next second half of this conversation, is once the theater takes their money, uh, you know, their share, and the distributor takes their share, and it gets back down to us, then that's about, then, then that be, it's still a profitable endeavor. But once we get kind of below that 5,000, 4,000, 3,000 area, the, the profit of doing the work and marketing the movie and get it out there to that theater starts to really be kind of like diminishing returns. And we, and so we said, look, because we don't have a lot, this is not a quantity of scale. This is like, uh, so like handpicked selecting theaters. We have to be very efficient and selective at where we're going. And 5,000 seemed like a good number to do that at. Yeah. Well, if you think about it, it also saves us a lot of energy, potentially wasted energy, because the way distributors go and book a movie is they reach out to all of their contacts, the theater bookers, and they say, we have a movie coming out, who wants it? And if we say, look, out of the 2000 contacts that you have, only speak to these 1250 theaters, that cuts out nearly half of the work that they would have to do normally if they were trying to put it out on only 500 or 600 screens like The Carpenter or only two to 300 screens for Faith of Angels. So obviously you need to reach out to more people than two to 300 theaters, because if some of them say no, or they can't, they can't take the movie because they're already booked or because they don't see it as like the most valuable. Again, it goes back to supply and demand. If they think they can make more money for that weekend from another movie, they're going to keep that other movie in theaters. So it's all supply and demand. So we're reaching out to a thousand in order to get two to three or 400, right? It's probably somewhere in that range. But if we can say, don't reach out to these 1500, that that just saves them time and effort of having to do email replies and everything to all those theaters. So it's actually helping us be more effective and efficient with our time and when the, the limited small team that we have for this movie. I think that there's also the benefit of saying, does the theater qualify, you know, does it do 5,000 or more on these comp titles average? Uh, and if it doesn't, uh, you know, Purdy has been approached by different distributors. You know, you've got everybody from AMC and Cinemark to um, maybe these small independent mom and pop type theaters. And, and as word of the movie gets out, theaters want good content. And so they'll reach out to Purdy um, and Purdy can look and say, if they've, if they've booked below 5,000, it's not that we don't want to book there, but what can they do to maybe mitigate the costs of us getting the movie there? 
um, do, can we can we negotiate better terms instead of the theater taking sixty percent? Let's have the theater take less, and so that uh, we can offset the cost of opening in a lower producing theater. Yeah, so so true. So that really nicely kind of transitions us into the next aspect of this. But to summarize, like we went through a whole bunch of data, we identified. 2,848 theaters that had released comparable movies in our genre and kind of our size of release and identified 1,250 that had done at least $5,000 for the run of show in that theater. And we basically said to our distributor, these are the ones we want to book, right? And so that hopefully helps us increase our per screen average for the run of show so that we've got a better chance of doing better numbers. So that was our thought process with going through, you know, for 90 minutes, two hours one day a few weeks ago and coming up with this data. So hopefully that's helpful for those of you because I know a lot of listeners are kind of listening to this podcast for strategy and we're we're more than happy to share it because if more indie movies do well, guess what? We can make more indie movies, all of us, not just you and I. So that's our release and our comps and then the second part is how do movies make money? Now we're talking right now specifically the theatrical release because there's certainly plenty of other, we call them windows, um, where movies make money. You have different flavors of streaming and you have uh, purchases like you, people can buy Blu-rays or DVDs. They can purchase digital downloads. They can rent them. They can stream them. They can watch them on cable. They can watch them in a plane. There's all these different ways that you can do it. So we're specifically talking about the theatrical release right now. And maybe once we're done with the theatrical release in season two of this podcast, we can dive into the digital strategy as well. But um that's the question we're here to answer today, right? How do movies make money? So Garrett, how do you want to walk through this so that it's clear for the audience to go, oh, I get it now? <laughs> well, I can, I'll can. i walk through that and you can diagram it. And that way, if you're right. listening, you can just hear me describing it. And if you're watching, you can see Darren's diagram. I will say that, um, yeah, that post-theatrical r- revenue is growing and a challenge. And I'm excited. We've got some partners that we'll invite on the podcast who for Faith of Angels have come on early, have been very, very supportive of the theatrical release in hopes to um, grow that post-theatrical revenue through SVOD or TVOD or AVOD um, um, and all of the different licensing opportunities that come with that. The better we do in theaters, though, um, significantly impacts the post-theatrical opportunities. So that's why we want an audience. That's why in a theatrical release, we you don't you don't come out of the gate saying, "Hey, we're in theaters in September, and we'll be on DVD and whatever." It's like, no, no, no. This may or may not ever ever see the DVD. We have to like drive an audience to go see it in theaters, and and there is truth to that. If it flops in theaters, it's a little bit harder to make a uh, DVD deal or streaming. I keep saying DVD. That that is like dating myself, but uh, <laughs> streaming or licensing deal. So at any rate, back to your question, Darren, you've got a uh, theatrical written on your board, theatrical revenue and how that works. Basically, let's just start with, just say there's the gross box office, right? That's what we see uh, on the news, you know, on the top 10, say, hey, top 10 box office this weekend, you know, oh, Deadpool did $100 million or whatever it is, or or, or this little movie did $2 million at the box office that weekend. And we could probably just break that down. So we actually just looked at that title on Box Office Mojo which was at Stri 2 or something, and said, hey, they did $2 million at the box office. So let's take that $2 million, right? Gross box office in an opening weekend. And I'm going to put it in a waterfall. And the waterfall is just a Google Doc that, are, you know, I'm, everybody has one, a, a, a strategy or a way to track. I've developed this waterfall for my first film, and I've just been doing it, repeating it over and over. So we, you take your gross box office for the weekend, $2 million. The theaters for an independent film... It's all negotiated, but it averages that the theaters take 60%. Um, Again, depending on the scale of the theater, the brand of the theater, the owners, what others playing, how long your movie has been in theaters, you know, your opening weekend, they might take 60, but then it trickles down. So then now they're taking less and less and less. 
but it, it averages 60%. Is kind of That's how we work it out. So from 2 million, now the theaters take 60%. So they take 1.2 million. That leaves 800,000 net that goes to your distributor. Uh, the distributor then takes their percentage, and that is going to vary from whatever your agreement, whatever you've negotiated with your distributor. 15%, 0.5%. I've, I've seen as much as 27 be asked. I've paid as little as 15%. Uh, so you, you just have to kind of average that out. Uh, but in your waterfall, you say, okay, the distributor takes their fee from the net uh, after the theaters take theirs. A lot of times there's confusion when we say, hey, theaters take 60 and distributor takes 20. And the filmmaker goes, well, that leaves very little. I mean, and the truth is it does leave very little. But don't let your distributor take 20% of gross. The distributor takes 20% of net. So 20% of the 160, uh, of the 800,000 is 160. So that leaves 640,000 off of a $2 million gross box office. 640,000 then goes back to the production company or the film company. Now, depending on where your funding came from and your agreements with your investors, that 640,000 goes to pay back, in our case, our p a investors, our p a lenders, which are lending you know, uh, for the marketing of the movie. They're usually first in line. p a lending is a, is, a, is a good way to be involved in movies because it's kind of last money in, first money out. Uh, but the upside isn't as great. You know, you get your, you know, your p a lender is usually, uh, here's your cost plus 10% back. Um, as you get to bigger and bigger films, you can do different types of loans on that. You know, you can just go get a bridge loan or a finishing loan or bank loan uh, that might have a lower percentage. Um, but you just want to make sure that that money is as cheap as you can find it. So in our case, P&A lenders come in and, and we give them 100% plus 10%. Uh, so, so if we assume for a $2 million movie, can we assume a $500,000 P&A investment? Sure, sure. That, so that yes, would be the P&A investment is dependent on... They're paid back, right? Correct. So, uh, yeah, so from that 640, 640000 that came to the production company from the distributor, they're going to pay back their P&A lenders, which is 550000 which leaves what, 90,000 to start to pay back your negative cost. And your negative cost is the cost of your film. Usually those investors are equity investors. And so they are, there's more upside on that. Uh, they come in when the film is just an idea, like a random no-name director is pitching the movie to, you know, somebody with funds and, uh, they're taking a significant risk. And so that money is usually more expensive. Um, so for our investment on Faith of Angels, it's 125%. Yeah. The investor paid for the budget of the movie. We're going to pay them back the budget plus 25%. Yeah. So we're running out of uh, money from the box office at this point because at, at, if they're spending 500000 on P&A, we're assuming that's at least 50% of the production budget which would put it around a million dollars, right? So if you if they spent a million dollars and the negative cost plus recoupment of 25%, that'd be $1.25 million. We only have 90 grand left from the, blo the box office of this movie. So why don't we do another example over here to the right um, and do like a $5 million global box office? Or okay, gross box. yeah, we'll keep going on. All right. Yeah, so I mean, and, uh, just yeah, to show and, and that your point, your that. point is made. I mean, that that two million people look at that and go, two million dollar box office. Uh, that's, you know, oh, you guys are, you're, you, you got it made in the shade, and that's not true. <laughs> I mean, the filmmaker at this point hasn't seen a dime because we haven't paid back our negative cost on a. You're suggesting that you know, in this model, the negative cost is a million dollars. Well, that's 1.25 that the filmmaker's got to pay back to his investor, and he's got ninety thousand dollars to do that. Now, we took the opening box office of two million, 
um, you know, that was the opening weekend for that movie. So you might scroll down and say, hey, let's check back in five weekends when that movie has run its course. Your, your opening box office is usually, uh, it, there's usually a multiplier of about four for, your, for the run of the movie. So you can say, okay, Scree 2, Scree 2, uh, you know, if it's opening box office is 2 million, do a multiplier of four. Uh, so you're at 8 million probably for your run of show. Um, you know, and it starts to, starts to add up a little bit. Um, okay. What were you saying? Let's do, let's do a $5 million example. You've got that built in. So I'm going to yeah, go into my waterfall total box office for a movie. Yeah. So, okay. Let's say at the end of the day, uh, we collect, no, oh, that's 50 million. I got to put in the right amount of zeros. Say at the end of the day, our gross box office is five million. All right. Again, theaters take sixty percent, so they take three million of that. That's two million back to the distributor. The distributor takes their fee, which is twenty percent of that two million of that net. Uh, so the distributor takes four hundred thousand. That leaves one point six million to the filmmaker. The filmmaker recoups one point six million from that. So from a PNA loan, you're suggesting the PNA loan is 500,000. So I'm going to just make that work in, in my waterfall real quick, 470. Uh, what do I need to do to make that work? I need to add 31. <laughs> okay, so at 500,000 then, so we've got 1.6 million to start to pay off the PNA. If the PNA is... Uh, 300,000, that didn't work. Let me just do this real quick. 10. PA is 500,000 um, from that 1.6. 1 1.1 is left. The PA interest is 56.5 on that. Is that right? Yep. So 56.5 from that 56.5, we've got 1.043 is left. So just over uh, 1,043,000. And that then starts to pay back your negative cost. If the cost is a million plus 25% interest, guess what? You're still short. <laughs> it adds You're still up. Short, right? It adds up. It's pretty crazy. And people, you know, this is why a lot of investors are afraid of this, <laughs> this investment. Because if you actually, if you haven't even done this math, as a filmmaker, if you're just like, oh yeah, we're just going to put the movie in theaters and make our money back. If you haven't actually run the numbers, like this is really serious stuff. I was talking to an investor just the other day um, at a meetup and it was like, how do you guys make money? And it was like, I was walking him through this essentially just with my, in, in my head. And they were like, I, I don't see it. And I'm like, well, you got to make sure that you have a good strategy beforehand because if you just go into the marketplace with no plan. It really doesn't work out for everybody. But if you have a plan and if you've run these numbers, well, guess what? You can figure out what it takes to be profitable. Now, we should include that like, yes, it would be amazing for your movie to get into profit during a theatrical run. Lots of movies have done that. It's not impossible. Plenty of indie movies have done that. It's not impossible, but you have to have a plan for how to do it. So you need to understand what's the number that you have to hit in the box office in order to get to break even in order to enter into profit. And so let's do one more just for the sake of people being able to see, because we haven't even got to producers net, right? And we want to get there at some point. You and I want to get paid. Our filmmakers want to get paid. Yeah, we, so, haven't, we haven't made anything yet. And we've if we're looking at a gross box office of $5 million, which is huge for an independent mm -hmm. film, and uh, at the end of the day, we're still holding an empty bag, That's I guess that's why we have day jobs. Yeah. Uh, but simultaneously, you know, if you if you get to the point where your negative cost is all but recouped, like at this point, we're about um, two hundred thousand dollars short of covering the one hundred twenty five percent of investment from that um, the negative cost. Right. You know, that means we only need to do about five hundred five point five million in theaters in order to break even break into profitability. But then you have all those other windows that we talked about that there are fewer participants in, right? You don't have a theater taking 60%. You don't have PNA lenders still getting recouped, right? And so 
you're now able to make a larger percentage of the money you make from streaming deals, from rentals, from all the other windows that are out there. So it, it doesn't it, mean that if you're not profitable in theaters, you'll never be profitable. You just want right. to get as close as you can to profitability and ideally into profitability from theatrical so that you can do really well. Okay, so let's do one more example just so we can um, go into what it looks like for a producer, for example, like yourself, um, the production company who owns the film, how, how and when do they make money and how much do they need to make given these kind of same numbers, same budget of a million dollars, same P&A of $500,000. So where do you want to start? Do you want to do an $8 million box office or a seven and a half or a 10? So I'll show you a secret. Well, I won't show you a secret. You take your <laughs> list of comp titles and you say those 1,000 plus screens that did 5,000 or more, and you take mm -hmm. those averages and say, if we were to play on those, you know, if this, if this takes off or whatever, and there's always the if, and once you start hypothesizing like that, I think it's, you're in dangerous water, but, uh, for the sake of this podcast, we'll hypothesize. Uh, so that, that is in it. Essentially you take all of those theaters you say, what were their averages and what do they total? And you're at an $11 million box office. Great. So let's play do an 11. Then. Love it. So we have 11 million right here at the top. And then, so same thing. Let's, let me get my calculator out because I don't do public same math. Thing. I got it. So, it's all built in. So 11 million gross box office. Theaters take <laughs> an average of 60%. You're at 6.6 .6 million to the theaters. So the distributor is going to collect 4.4 million. 4, oh. 4 they They're okay, going to take their 20% of that. And wait, wait, wait. I'm, I'm behind. <laughs> okay. You're fine. Oh, you're okay. just getting the colors right. So you always do these, so, these charts that are so visibly, um, they're like aesthetically organized and pleasing and colored. Yes. Uh, so th the distributor is going to take 4.4 million or recoup 4.4 million. Yep. They take 20% of that, which is 88,000. Uh, 8, 880, so that leaves for the film production company to pay off their costs, 3.5, Seems like a lot of money. This is great. Hey, we did it. We made a lot of money. Uh, wait till we start paying people back. Now, I'll just add this little uh, asterisk, this disclaimer. These are all very clean numbers, right? Uh, the theaters, again, you're negotiating your your their take on that. The distributor, you're negotiating their take, but also distributors can be um, notorious for having distribution fees on top of that, or you know they're paying your costs. I think it's very good to have a good distributor that's transparent and have a great contract and agreement to say, look, no distribution, your costs come out of your fee. And there's $880,000 that's going to the distributor. They do an incredible amount of work, but that's the risk that they take. At this point, everybody is risking. Um, okay. Yep. And, uh, uh, so we're at 3.300, 3, 3,520,000, uh, that goes back to the production company. Our P and a lend was 500,000. Plus interest is fifty six thousand. Five sixty. Oh, interest is fifty six. So five fifty six is the total back to them. Total back to uh, lenders, P and A lenders. It's five fifty six plus five hundred five five six five. Uh, but it's okay. Um, th that leaves us just about two point seven eight five for our negative cost investor. Guess what? He came in, you know, if we're saying the budget for the movie is the same, it's a million dollar movie, plus their $250,000 interest. So now our negative cost investor has recouped. At that point, we're in the green. Or we're in the black. Hey. What's it called? The black? In the black, yeah. Uh, I'm going to go back to black now. <laughs> yeah, that's our Black Friday. So, so what's that math? Two seven eight five minus one two fifty. So one point five. One point five three five. 
is our is is the is the now the take that the production company has, and it depends on what your agreement is with your negative cost investor. They came in for their cost plus twenty five percent. Our agreements is fifty fifty for the life of the film. That's again the high, the amount of risk that a negative cost investor comes in is substantial, and so we try to say, hey, if we win, you win. If the film does big, everybody benefits. And so we do a 50-50. So from that 1.535 million, 50% goes to the negative cost investor. So 767,000 goes to the negative cost. And 760,000, 767,000 goes back to the production company. So that's the risk. Again, that that it's like, oh, that's a big number. That's an exciting number, 767,000. That's from an $11 million box office, which is a, a, a unicorn. That's a lightning in a bottle thing. And so there has to be different ways to recoup. Um, this, yeah, again, this, you've, you've actually sketched out, Darren, exactly what I pitch to when I pitch these um, initial investors, which is, hey, guys, here's a very conservative estimate. And at $2 million, we may or may not make money, uh, negative cost investor, may or may not make money in the theaters. Here's a, here's a, um, you know, regular type amount. Here's a $5 million box office. Still, we're at not paying you back all the way. So I try to manage expectations when I pitch and say, this is not, you know, if you're, if you're looking at this and going, hey, we're going to make $2 million in the box office. So let's spend a million dollars to make the film. It's a bad plan. Not gonna, it doesn't work that way. Yep. Oh man, I love this stuff. So, you know, somewhere in that range of call it five or six, probably closer to six million to 11 million is where you're into profitability as the production company that made the movie. And so, what do we take away from this? So, for me, the more that you can own and do on your own, the less you're splitting. So starting at the beginning, 50-50 is a big split, right? That's half. So if you can finance the movie yourself, you don't have to give 50% away and you don't have to have someone in position before you who's going to recoup plus 25%. I've seen people do 135% or uh, 35% preferred interest for the first people that come in on an investment in the movie. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of your profit you're giving up, right? Now, it's always a trade-off. That doesn't mean investors are bad. It just is showing the economics of this to say, if you want to make more from your movies, you've got to take on more of the risk. So you've got to take on the risk of investing in the movie. You've got to take on then the risk of financing the P&A for the movie. That's another 10, 15% that you're giving away. And then it, this is where you get into the territory of being your own studio because you're now producing films and distributing them. That's what studios do. So if you look at A24 and Neon and Focus Features and Roadside and like they're financing the movies, but then they're also, uh, they may or may not be producing them, but they're hiring, contracting a company that's a work for hire Maybe they get a little percentage. We don't want to get too into the weeds on the details of this stuff. But like, that's why companies go from producing films to producing and distributing films. And I know a couple of uh, individual executive producers that have been so frustrated with how little comes back to them from a release of a movie. They're just like, I'm going to do this myself. I'm going to do the distribution all on my own because they were upset with how the deals played out. So if you can take on distribution... Now you've got that percentage. Now, the likelihood of you starting your own theater chain that has a thousand theaters, good luck, right? Like yeah, Cinemark has done that. I think AMC is only at like 500 or something. So there's not a lot of chains that have hundreds of theaters. Even Megaplex, our local big guy is like 25, right? So you can, the more you take on, the, the less you're giving away, the less quote unquote middlemen there are that are in position before you so if you want to have this be a more profitable endeavor, you got to take on more of that risk. Um, but also thinking about, okay, this is only one of many windows where your movie can make money. This is the initial kind of big push where it makes kind of the most money. But from there you have forever that you can 
put the film online. You can license it to other streamers. You can uh, sell the movie, rent the movie, stream the movie. There's all these different flavors of doing that where you can continue to make money for the life of the film. As an indie filmmaker, uh, you know, putting these waterfalls together, I look at this and go, look, this is, this is very deflating. Like how, why, why do we even do this? Uh, and um, obviously there's that drive to tell stories and, and there's that thrill of testing it out, of risking it. Like this is an inherently a risky business. When I, when I have conversations with investors and they talk about how can we, I, I, I mean, to a certain extent, it's important to mitigate the risks, but if there's that mentality of, I don't want to take a, I don't want to risk anything, that conversation ends pretty quickly. It's like, we're, we gotta, we gotta do this together. We're gonna be nervous together, uh, and we'll get through. We'll run this play, and uh, at the end, we'll we'll see how it turns out. Um, and the, and there are ups and downs all along throughout throughout the entire process. It's important not to be deflated though. To go okay. People are doing this. This is if, if this is the business that we're in, and we're going to just keep swinging at it until we can make it work. And I think that that's what we're trying to do with these two films. Yeah, exactly. There's one other number that we didn't talk about, but like once you've kind of hit that break-even point, your um, negative cost investors, your equity investors are recouped fully. That 125 percent. Now, now you're into 50-50 split. So whether that's five million or five and a half million, everything after that point, you can kind of look at somewhere in the range of 15 to 20 cents per dollar that comes back to you as the production company that owns the movie. So that's kind of a fun number that I, I know I think about all the time. It's like, oh, okay, if I if we hit five million or six million, everything after that, I get 15 cents or 13 cents or 18 cents or whatever the numbers work out to be. And so that's where you're motivated to not just put the movie in theaters and see how it does. It's like what we're doing through this podcast, or at least documenting on this podcast of here's how we're going to get to five. Here's how we're going to get to 10. Here's how we're going to do it. And it's not a hope strategy. It's a plan. And if the plan doesn't work out, okay, we, we tried. And now we have data that we can use the next time, but at least we had um, an objective and uh, some data that says, here's our plan to do this. And then we can adjust the plan in the future to say, oh, well, we planned this last time. It didn't really work. So we need a different plan this time. And then we do a different plan, <laughs> right? Yeah. And so it's exciting to get data from theatrical, from our own plan uh, being run in a few weeks, um, really this week as this episode comes out, like we mentioned, but it's very exciting. And I, I think it's a really smart approach to the business of filmmaking. It can't just be, oh, we're really passionate about this movie and we think it's really good and it deserves to be in theaters and we hope that you guys show up and and do it and buy tickets. It's like, well, that's, that's not a strategy. <laughs> so, I can't. yeah. I think the, uh, two other numbers we haven't talked about too is like, how do you, how do you avoid being that d deflated thing or how do you you know, for an independent film to make six million dollars at box office is very, you know, that's very rare. They just don't do that. So, why do it, and how can you do it? And at this, it, it starts at the top. You say, how can we make this movie for cheaper? Where can we where can we save money? Certainly, you can't sacrifice the quality uh, of the content or or the idea that you want to tell. Um, but filmmakers can win big, as we have done in the past, by making your film. For much cheaper, you know, maybe spending less on your marketing, and that brings down that theatrical nut that you have to make uh, before profitability. Yeah. When I think it also goes back to this idea from day one of this podcast is the importance of an audience because that's free marketing. So if you can build a brand like Pixar, like Blumhouse, like A24, like yeah. the ones we talked about, well, when you have a movie come out, all they need to do is say, here's a new trailer. And then everybody's yeah. excited. There's a million people right there. Even Angel Studios has figured this out where they can pretty much guarantee a couple million dollar opening weekend at about a 10 to $15 million box office for each movie that they do. So if they spent 5 million on the movie and another five on the marketing, that's not profitable. But if the, you know you look at His Only Son or you look at some of the other movies they've done for 
two and a half or $3 million or less. His only son was, I think a $250,000 movie. Um, that's massively profitable at a $12 million box office. Yeah. So, and also angel did what we were just talking about. They own all of it. So they own the movie. They own the, the marketing. They're putting up the money for their P and a, they're actually raising it from their audience, but we won't get into that, <laughs> but like they own it, they own all the pieces and then they distribute it. So they have a much bigger chunk coming back to them than just the 20 to 35% as being a distributor. They own everything that comes after that theatrical uh, take. So they're getting 40%. They're going to recoup a lot faster. So I think that's the big takeaway is like, if you're, if you don't want to be discouraged, start building your audience today and then have a strategy that really aligns with the type and size of audience you have. If you have a thousand people that'll show up and, and see your movie, do a, a release where you're profitable at a thousand people and you're not losing money in theaters, but you're yeah. making a little bit of your money back. So rent a theater for a few weekends or a few days over one weekend. I've seen plenty of films do that. Some of these um, music documentary or concert films that will release for four days and make $2 million because there's a couple hundred thousand people that'll go see it. It's like, great, do that. <laughs> they didn't put it on 4,000 screens. They put it on 500. So I'm getting uh, redundant at this point. But yeah, focus on building an audience that you can then deliver value to by putting your movies in theaters and they'll show up. It's a good plan. Uh, Darren tonight premiere. We'll see you there. I cannot wait. I gotta go get my suit. I gotta go get a tux. I want to dress nice tonight. I want to look like I can't be like, I came from church. Here's my suit that I wear every week. I gotta, I gotta show up tonight. So I'll plant that All seed right, now and everybody can see the pictures of what I'm wearing on the red carpet. I'm going to be, I'll be in my church suit. I'm trying to save money after going through the numbers. I'm like, yeah, we got to save some money. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, that's a very cool episode. I don't think we're going to answer any questions today because we just answered a lot. Um, but thank you all for listening. Share this episode with your filmmaker friends and, and investor friends, because this is a huge resource to be able to understand the numbers here. And, and it, does uh, work. Yeah. it does work. We've seen it work. It does work. Evidence that it works. This is our eighth film. Some recoup in the theaters. Some don't. There's post theatrical that, um, you know, it is a business and, and, uh, yeah, don't, don't, don't be downhearted about it. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, man. Another okay. great episode. We'll see you tonight Thanks, buddy. and we'll see you next week. Can't wait. Talk <laughs> to you later. Boy. See ya. Thank you for listening to this episode of Truly Independent. To join us on the journey, be notified of new episodes and screenings and ask us questions about today's episode, head over to threecoinpro.com slash podcast and put in your name and an email address. If you're a fan of the show, please leave us a review on your favorite podcast app and be sure to share this episode with a friend. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next week. Our intro and outro music is Election Time by Kjartan Abel.